Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Wrestling Territories podcast. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, kind of the downhill side of Jim Crockett promotions when it started going downhill in 1988. So I want to touch back on the past before that and then what led up to it and then kind of how it went afterwards. Now, all this is from a fan's perspective. I have no backstage knowledge of anything. Things I've listened to in other podcasts and things like that is what I've learned. But from my own perspective, what I saw back then, that's what I'm going to be talking about. So with Jim Crockett Promotions, uh, before 1988, uh, let's say 83 to 86, from 83 to 86 um was really on fire really good uh, a lot of stuff going on the promotion was doing good as fans were really engaged now um so around the kind of latter part of 87 uh you you see some changes some things going on even a little bit before that you see where jim crockett has purchased the UWF, uh, NWA Central, and Florida Championship Brass, and all that has been bought out by Jim Crockett Promotions, and he'd already bought the Georgia area uh, when he bought uh, bought it from the WWF when Vince McMahon had it. So, basically, before 1988, like I say, we're all engaged in stuff. You, you know, you had the, the emergence of the Rock and Roll Express in 85, the Road Warriors coming on board uh, later that year. Uh, you have the Midnight Express that joins. So 85 into 86, it's really moving. I mean, you got the Horsemen that just got, you know, created by Arn Anderson and everybody. But um, the everybody's engaged. Everybody's enjoying it. Everybody's having a good time with it, right? And uh, Dusty Rose at that time is still extremely popular. And that changes, too, over time. But let's go into 87. So this is where things start to change for Jim Crockett. You start to see, again, like I said, the the, the, the wrestling change for Jim Crockett. It goes to uh, the UWF and, like I said, Central and Florida, along with, of course, Jim Crockett Promotions of Mid-Atlantic Territory. And so at this point in time, uh, around the summer of 87, still some pretty good matches. You got the Rock and Roll of the Midnight feuding. The Freebirds are there. Uh, you, you see some people you don't, you don't see in Jim Crockett promotions before that, like Dr. D. Steve Williams. You see, and, and where I live in North Carolina, we were able to see more of this, uh, the Florida wrestling, uh, the uh, UWF. Uh, one of the first matches I remember seeing from the UWF uh, was, uh, I forget all the matches, but the main event was when the Lightning Express defeated Sting and, and uh, Rick Steiner for the UWF Tag Team Belts. So you, you see this nuance of people coming in. And then later in 87, of course, Ron Garvin becomes world champion. Now, he becomes world champion in, in Michigan and loses it in Chicago. And these are two places it's not really Jim Crockett territory. He had those two things happen in Greensboro or Atlanta or something like that. It had been a big difference for Crockett, but, uh, star K was in uh, Chicago and a lot of people have said that was probably the worst thing. And I agree too. I don't think it was a good idea to have it out of the region that it had been set in for since 1983. And, so you go into 87 with that. You have all these changes and stuff. You have the WWF doing this underhanded thing to Jim Crockett telling pay-per-view channels, if you uh, carry Starcade, you won't carry WrestleMania. It's just, it's just a nightmare. It should never happen, but it did. And um, then you start to move into 88. And 88, early 88 is pretty good. You have... Lex Luger, who just left the Four Horsemen, he's starting to become popular. You have Sting, really, you know, he's he's a face at this time. He he left the uh, hot stuff Eddie Gilbert back in '87, and was starting to uh, find his own against Ric Flair. And so, um, you had the Class of Champions going on. You have you have some good stuff in early '88, but. Around this time, between 87 and 88, you start losing a lot of good people who have helped build it from 
uh, you know, 83 on. And you, you lost people like um, in 87, you lost the Raging Bull and Rick Rude. Those are two guys with the World Tag Team Champions. Kind of controversial. If you go back and see my podcast about Paul Jones's Army, that explains a little bit of what happened there. So, you know, Boogie Woogie Man's gone at this time. Um, so, like I say, you see these new people from the other territories coming in in 87. But in 88, um, about the summer of 88, you have Luger fighting Flair for the world belt. Um, you have uh, this Tower of Doom is in the pay-per-view for the Great American Bash. The Great American Bash was just not that good of a pay-per-view. Um, it, it had... Um, it opened with Sting and, and Nikita going after the World Tag Titles against Tully and Arn. Um, but Sting and Nikita were not known to be a tag team. I mean, they had teamed up a little bit, but and they're good friends or whatever. But, you know, uh, and I've heard Tully Blanchard say this before, if you put them against the Road Warriors, it would have been a much better matchup. And I couldn't agree more because, I mean, nothing against Sting and Nikita, but just not being a tag team for a long period of time, it, it makes for a, a difference. Um then if you had the road warriors in there who, you know, you could have put the road warriors in that match and put sting and Nikita in the tower of doom. But anyway, and then you have Ron Garvin who had held the world title in 87 and not a very successful run. You move it into 88 and he becomes a heel knocking out dusty roads in the U S title match. A lot of people couldn't. I mean, the good thing about that was nobody saw that coming. I love it when there's a heel change and nobody sees anything happening. Like you, you had no idea this was going to happen. So that was a good um, thing, not to know that was going to happen. And, you know, but anyway, then, then you know, Flair, you know, defeats Luger, and then after the start, or after I'm sorry, after the Great American Bash, it's not long after that the Midnight Express become World Tag Champions and Tully and Arn leave. So when Tully and Arn leave, it's very very tough because they are a very central part of the NWA at that time, right? They're the tag team champions are big heels and they're, they're helping draw big audiences. So you lost two of the best. That's not good. And, and over time you start to see changes going on. Barry Wim, Rick Flair is still there. They're having certain feuds with like the midnight express or still dealing with Lex Luger. It's just back and forth. It's kind of chaotic. And so Starcade 88 comes along. You have the original Midnight Express versus Jim Cornette's Midnight Express. So you have Paulie Dangerously's team come in. Um, a good feud, don't get me wrong. Uh, you had for a bit, you had Nikita Koloff helping uh, his uncle Ivan out against the Russian assassins of Paul John, but then Nikita leaves. Uh, you bring Junkyard Dog in, in that spot. Um, so it's like a lot of interchanging parts that you're having a hard time keeping up with. Whereas in the past, it was pretty easy to keep up with and people were staying in there and, you know, the fuse were lasting for quite some time. I mean, Dusty and the horsemen, I mean, you know, Dusty's interchanging parts with either it be with the rock and roll express or the road wars or whatever, but you could count on those to be consistent. Whereas in 88, it was just at least consistent. I mean, Jim Crockett's selling to, uh, Ted Turner, and it's just all falling apart. And um, <clears throat> from, excuse me, from the fans' perspective, we, you see this and you notice it, and it's kind of like the interest is starting to um, to go down. And, um, you know, it's just not a real good thing. And um, we're going to talk more about that in just a moment. Hang tight. Okay, so in this next part, I want to get into, um, I want to talk a little bit about how, um, again, you, you're losing some good people. You're losing Tully and Arm, <clears throat> excuse me, and you're, you're having, like I said, the original Midnight Express, and well, that's a good few of the Midnight Express, but the thing is, in early 89, Dennis Conner just up and leaves. Um, and I cover that in The Fire That Burns, Ronnie Garvin. Um, but so you can go check that video out and, and it explains a little bit more about that. But again, the, the interchanging parts of, of players that were good early on are now gone and you're just having almost a hodgepodge of people coming through like the ding dongs. I put this on TikTok recently. It's one of the worst gimmicks ever in professional wrestling, the ding dongs. It was just horrible. 
And uh, so you, you've seen this. So Ricky Steamboat coming in does help. So you have Steamboat coming in. He's facing off against Ric Flair. Flair and Barry Wyndham are still together. As the last part of the Horseman, J.J. Dillon's leaving. It's, um, you know, another changing part. So uh, Ricky Steamboat defeats Ric Flair and becomes world champion, defeats him again at the Clash of the Champions, and then loses it to at Wrestle War 89. But by this time, Barry Windham has lost the U.S. title to Lex Luger, and now he's gone. So now Lex Luger's going heel against Ricky Steamboat, and then after that, Ricky Steamboat's gone. So it's just they're, they're, things are not lasting long at all. Um, so now you have Flair as a good guy with Sting against uh, um, Terry Funk and Gary Hart's group with Muda and, and all those guys. So, again, it's just so much. And then you had the Road Warriors go heel in 88. They're now facing 89 against the Varsity Club. So, again, everything's just moving around so much. And nobody's staying around long enough for it to matter like it was back in the day. So, when you had the Horsemen versus Dusty versus Nikita versus the Road Warriors, it was constantly going on, you know, to, to where people could keep up with it. And you got to see some real good feuds. You got to see a Ricky Morton versus a Tully Blanchard for the TV belt. You got to see Ron Garvin chase the title. You got to see, um, you know, the Russians against the Rock and Roll Express, and it just on and on. But the storylines were lasting months. By the time 88 and 89 and early 90 comes along, things have changed so much you just can't keep up with it. And then – you have Sting as a horseman. Sting kicked out of the horseman in 1990. Sting gets injured. Now Lex Luger's a face again. He's facing against Ric Flair for the belt. He has two chances at, uh, say, his wrestle war and then uh, capital combat. Uh, another horrible pay-per-view in a way because uh, the pay-per-view itself is all right, but you had RoboCop, and, and like others, I just wasn't a big fan of seeing that happen. But... Anyway, so Sting is hurt. Sting comes back and becomes world champion in 90. And it just keeps bouncing around. You know, you have Paul Orndorff come in. JYD's come back. Um, Michael Hayes was a good guy. Now he's a back. I mean, it's just, it's just on and on. Now, I know this may be a little bit difficult to keep up with, but you'd have to go back and watch all these things. But if, if, if you ever get a chance, go back and watch the, say, uh, if you got the Peacock Network, you can watch a WWE on there. Go back and look at those early Mid Atlantic days, and also the World Championship Wrestling Saturday Night days. Um, you can keep up with that a whole lot better than what we could in '88 and '89. So, if you're new to wrestling, or if you've never seen that before, you're too young to remember that, or wasn't born yet. Go back and check those out because it was cool and easy to keep up with up until then. And it just like, you could see everything was falling apart. You know, the new ownership of, of Turner becoming WCW over time. Oh man. It, it's just, it's really a, a, a nightmare to keep up with. And I started losing interest around 91, really. I mean, completely losing interest in, in around 91 up until uh, about 94, 95. And then nitro comes along. NWO, then it becomes interesting in because they're keeping up with, uh, you know, constant storylines and stuff like that. So that's a good thing. But in that time frame there from 19, late, late 87 until probably Nitro, it's hard to keep up with. You know, it's a lot of interchanging parts. And um, you, you can see the contrast and styles from the time before that until then um from from let's say 83 to 86 and then 88 to 94 95 but if you ever do do, do yourself a favor if you had the network go back and watch them and kind of like binge watch it if you want or watch it over time but you'll get un, you'll get an understanding of what i mean there's consistency of the storylines which is very very important long-term storytelling as they call it which is really good and you didn't have as many people leaving territories so quickly uh, but anyway, it, it was uh, a very interesting era in professional wrestling. So, guys, I hope you enjoyed it. This little short video about uh, the downhill side of, of Jim Crockett Promotions. And until next time, God bless. See you soon.